This I conference did. will now be recorded. The magic words, thanks. Okay, we call a meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with the review of the last meetings, the summary of the last meetings, which I read through and felt like it was pretty pretty accurate. I didn't see any anything, but it's certainly open to correction or adjustments if anybody has any they'd like to offer. It always amazes me how close it comes to what we were talking about. So good job, Ron. Okay, uh, let's move on then to agenda item number three, which is uh, administrative organizational summary. And Ron, you're you're taking that one? Yes, sir. I will. I'll kick it off at least. Um, so included um, a bit of information in the um, in the packet, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, you'll recall that uh, the subcommittee did get kind of briefly got an update from um, our partners at North Highland. Uh, Anna is here from North Highland this morning um, on their initial review of sort of RTD administrative overhead. Uh, included a link to that report in the packet for you all. Um, you know, we do have updated information related to um, kind of RTD's budget strategies for 2021 after getting through 2020. So I do want to kind of get to that uh, piece just to provide some, some context and uh, give me one second here. Great, thank you. So um, I think you're um, following to us. Yeah, Anna, just one second. So I did want to just share this one additional piece of information. So we do have, this is the RTD 2021 budget workforce reductions um, that were included in the um, uh, uh, proposed 21 budget. So uh, just give you a quick reference. There were uh, in the 2020 budget, 2,982 budgeted positions. Um, the 21 budget uh, workforce reductions totaled 736 uh, eliminated positions. 337 of those were vacant, uh, leaving 399 that were filled. So 77% or 309 of those filled positions were represented positions that were eliminated. And then 90 or about 23% were filled uh, salaried positions. Uh, and then get you to the 21 budgeted positions of 2246 um, as a result of those reductions. Now, keep in mind that as a result of the COVID relief funding, RTD has now recalled um, many of those filled represented positions. Um, so um, that is that kind of changed these numbers um, a fair bit on the represented position side. But I did want to just make sure everyone understood sort of the dynamic uh, from the original work that North Highland did. And with that, I will hand it off to um, Anna. Are you taking that? Uh, before, so, Anna, if you, don't, if you don't mind, before we move on to that, how many of those filled represented positions were restored? Um, I would have to defer to RTD for the exact um, current number that have been recalled. Um, did I see that Deborah or Doug are on the, are on the call? Yes, well, Kathy, I'm glad to see you joining us today. Welcome. And and uh, I don't know if you followed that very closely either. You might know too. Kathy Nesbitt. Does anybody know how many represented positions were uh, were filled? I know that they were there were quite a few that they were going after, but it's also my understanding that some of those people may have taken other jobs. It's sort of like taking the package. And, and moving on to something else. Do we have any information? Anybody so have anything Chair, to offer on that? Mr. Chair, this is Deborah Johnson, if I may, and I apologize, I am not, my raising hand function isn't working. Oh, I see. Uh, by all means, Deborah, you should always feel like you can speak up. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very kindly. Thank I appreciate that. So just for the committee's edification, when we talk about um, field represented positions, keeping in mind that bus operations includes a gamut of different positions. We're not just speaking as relates to um, 
frontline operators. We also have mechanics, we have mechanic helpers. Those are more or less like apprentice type positions to mechanics and things of the like. So we are currently in the process of recalling um, part-time operators. We have recalled full-time bus operators. And off the top of my head, roughly, I believe that number was close to 15 for bus operators full-time. Part-time bus operators was equivalent to 149 positions. Those are in the process and why I say they're in the process because individuals have to go through drug and alcohol testing. They have a period of time in which they can respond. The last update I had, we had heard from approximately 50 people that were in the hopper as relates to coming back into the fold. Additionally, there are other uh, uh, positions within the auspices of operations as well that have to do with um, rail operations as you can see down below on the chart that includes light rail vehicle operators there are light rail vehicle uh mechanics and in the process right now we're looking at other positions as relates to our general service delivery roll up i made reference to at a previous meeting meaning the soup to nut incorporation of putting forward any type of service modification plan going forward and that entails a multitude of different positions that are certified mechanics um, we're talking about dispatchers inspectors track maintainers signal maintainers on commuter rail so this is a broad brush overarching aspect and um, I am working with my teams right now as we look at additional positions relative to service delivery that could equate to about 60 positions. Okay. So there are significant changes from that right-hand column. Uh, uh, and But we don't really yet know how many of those people will, will be full-time or part-time employees going forward. I would say that's a fair assessment at this juncture. Okay, thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Of course. Anne, are you uh, are you ready? Um, I am, but I am actually going to pass to Tanya because uh, she's going to do a better job than I. I am. Certain in <laughs> uh, thanks, Anna. You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> By all means, go ahead, Tanya. Thank you. Um, I do have some slides to lead the discussion. Is it possible that um, I could be made presenter? Tanya, you should be able to go ahead and share your screen if you click on the share screen at the button at the bottom. Now it says I need to ask for permission. I need to ask the person. Yeah. Hmm. I can do that. While we wait on these technical pieces, oh, here we go. Thank Great. you. All right. Can you all see my screen? Let me go into a presentation mode. And is there, can you all see this? Yes, that looks good. Okay. Oh, no, I don't want to leave the meeting. Okay, great. <laughs> I'll leave this as is and we'll just uh, we'll work our way through it. So I uh, want to thank, um, thank the uh, uh, Accountability Finance Subcommittee for having us here today. We're happy to share an overview of our findings of the uh, assessment uh, overhead analysis that we did. Um, and so as we look at these results and these findings that we have, I just want to preface it by saying these are simply data points at a point in time. So all of the information Ron just shared and that um, Deborah Johnson just shared with us um, is not accounted for in this analysis. This analysis was done uh, back in um, I think we wrapped up in December. So, so bear that in mind as we go through. All right, so we'll just start with uh, quick introductions. We'll share our approach and then we'll really get into the findings and explore what those mean. And we'll, we'll stop there for questions. Um, I think you are all familiar with Anna and I, um, but we did want to uh, call out our colleague, Derek Pender, who wasn't able to join us today, but he did do a, a good deal of the work and analysis that went into this report, so we certainly want to acknowledge him. 
So we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, keeping time in mind, move on to um, the approach. So um, in our discover and analyze phase, we um, leveraged data that was provided by um, RTD, uh, specifically employee data um, broken down by departments with a median base income, as well as some org charts. And we also, for the purpose of uh, comparisons with uh, peer transit agencies, uh, gather data from the National Transit Database. You'll hear me refer to that as NTD. This is a standard reporting mechanism to the, uh, to the FTA um, that all agencies report to. And that gives us, you know, with those definitions, we get a good um, analysis uh, for comparison. So we analyzed um, the data um, and then um, also looked at uh, service levels in comparison to peer agencies to try to understand what some of those those numbers were me meant. Um, we also did a comparison um, to, to validate our findings. We looked at the RTD data as classified with NTD data, uh, just to ensure some alignment there and confirmed uh, with some uh, transit uh, experts um, that, that our findings were, were relevant and, and, and had some um, meat to them, had some context to them. So we're here today uh, to provide uh, in a presentation style the summary of that report, um, and there's also a, a written report as well. Um, just uh, briefly to level set on a couple of key terms um, used here, um, we're talking about administrative staff. We're talking about generally the roles that are supporting operations. So these are, you know, procurement activities. These are, um, you know, legal services and things that keep the operation running. And when we're talking about operational staff, we're talking about those who are directly engaged in operating systems. So bus operators, rail operators, and those like fr those frontline managers, for example. Also, when we're talking about salaries and wages, this excludes fringe benefits and paid time off, um, which can be an important um, metric um, for, for folks, um, obviously, um, in, their, in their overall compensation package. So uh, here are three of the findings. We're going to take a deeper dive into each of these. Um, and again, I just want to note these are simply data points. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think what we'll do in, in the slides that come is talk about what, what each of these mean and what they don't mean. So um, we will start with the relative spread of administrative personnel ratio amongst, um, amongst peer agencies. RTD does appear to be higher. Um, although, you know, that range is actually not that broad, right? So if you're, you're thinking, what is that, four, four of these agencies uh, fall above 10%. No, that's five, I'm sorry, <laughs> fall above 10%. And so um, RTD is, is a bit on the high side there. There's some important caveats here that are really important to that. And that is, um, you know, RTD relative to, to the peer agencies on the other side, um, they serve a greater number of square miles. So their system is far more expansive. That's going to require a lot more coordination with lo local municipalities um, and additional administration just to cover the region. Um, RTD also uh, provides more service than its peer agencies and provides that service to a smaller operation. So RTD covers more annual miles um, than average and also more revenue hours um, than all but two of the other peer agencies. So RTD is also doing this with fewer employees, this, this uh, uh, expansive service, expansive area, and they're actually doing this with, with a fewer number of employees. Mm -hmm. Another important note here is that um, economies of scale may be influencing this. So if we are to look at large transit agencies, such as um, you know, M New York MTA, for example, uh, I have the stat here, they're at 4.3%. Um, and if you use SEPTA as an example, they're at 8.4%. So it's likely that these are these agencies are realizing some economies to scale um, that, um, that that you know agencies the size of, of RTD are not able to capitalize on. Another important note here is that personnel count does not necessarily equate to spend or efficiency. So um, agencies have different approaches to how they might use outsourced staff. Um, and so this metric alone does not um, indicate any level of operational efficiency. Um, you know, there's regional context um, that may take into account uh, for certain behaviors. Like for example, um, some municipalities may be more litigious than others, and that might require more 
um, legal services. And you know, similarly, those legal services could be outsourced or they could be in-house. Um, so you know, again, that, that, that personnel doesn't necessarily equate to efficiency. Could I, could I ask a question on that part before we move yes. on? Yes. So are outsourced personnel included in these comparative statistics? I'm sorry, so, I was shaking my head yes, but I mean to shake, um, no. <laughs> was that a um, no yeah, or was that a yes? That is a no, no. The no. Um, contracted operations are not accounted for here. That's a very important note um, that you may hear me repeat a little bit later um, because um, that's not captured by NTT data. So for example, contracted operations at RTD, um, there's going to be an administrative oversight to that um, that, that does not also capture the operations, those contracted operators are not captured in the operations ranks under the RTD, NTD data. So it could be oversight of, for example, uh, con contractual bus services and things like that, but it could also be professional uh, services like legal that are outsourced. And Absolutely. those are not included in any, any of the measurements of overhead. Absolutely, that is correct, yes. Thank you. Sure. All right, so we'll move on to the second finding here um, related to um, salary and wages. Um, and that's just to say that RTD does appear to be a little bit higher when adjusted for the cost, cost of living. Um, but, you know, um, so while they may be higher, there are some, some reasons for these things, right? That, that could be, that, that could help explain why this could, is. Um, so, First, contracted services can't, I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm on the wrong section of notes. <laughs> um, I wanna make sure I have good stats to share with you when, when they are here, so I apologize. So um, anyway, the, the salary and wages are, are a little higher than most agencies, um, well, than their peer agencies, um, but this also does align with the previous finding, right, that there's higher administrative salaries, uh, that, that administrative salaries might be higher. Um, as, a, as a total of the employee population. So um, I think an important note here is the definition of, of wages and salaries. That, as I mentioned earlier, um, fringe benefits and paid time off are not inclusive here. So a pension, for example, um, at, at one um, property may make the benefits package larger, but the actual um, you know, wage is uh, uh, smaller. So there's some differentiation there. Um, because this isn't looking at a total compensation package, just wages. Um, These are adjusted for local sorry. cost of living. That is correct. All right. And when you say higher, um, what percent are we? Are you suggesting like? Oh, we have the percentage percent operational staff. I'm, I do you have this in a table here. Ah, okay. Um, you know, and I apologize, I don't have an overall summary number. I do have by property. So if we look at, and I can provide that um, as a follow-up, what the average is as a whole. Um, that's okay, I was just wondering what your general assumptions were when you say higher, that's all. Right, um, and that that is um, uh, wages adjusted for the cost of living. And then we have sort of a, a plus or minus for each of the um, uh, peer agencies that we evaluated. Um, so, for example, um, uh, Metro Minneapolis um, adjusted for the cost of living, um, RTD is point uh, is seven percent higher. But with LA Metro, when adjusted for the cost of living, um, uh, uh, RTD is a point twenty four percent lower. Point twenty four percent. That's insignificant, isn't it? That that is, um, and actually, in Sound Transit too. Um, had had a big differentiation at 29 percent. Yeah, uh, Kathy, I wonder if you would be willing to take this report and and read through it and create some questions to uh, give back to to North Highland. This is your area, much more sure. than it's ours. Uh, absolutely, can do that. Um, uh, I think it would be important. Yeah, just to make sure we're. We're understanding what some of the assumptions are, you know, 0.2 percent, whatever difference is yeah. in sequential. So, um, absolutely, I'll go through that and and provide that. That would be terrific. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. Thank you. Um, 
third point here is that the analysis is on total salaries and wages and not looking at individual positions and roles. Um, that information is not provided by NTD data. It's just sort of buckets of, of, of administrative. Uh, there are some operator level data, uh, but not specific enough to be all inclusive of operations on a whole. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, not complete in terms of compensation, total compensation, and nor is this a position by position or function by function analysis. Right, so our third finding was that um, RTD total salaries and wages as a percentage of operating expenses um, is on par with their peers. You see the average at 5.3% um, and RTD right there at 5.5%. Went wrong direction. There we go. Um, and again, we're going to get into the to the question about contracted operations, right? So, um, administrative ratios are absolutely impacted by that, as we discussed um, just a bit ago. Um, and then again, the the inability to review those contracted employees um, uh, uh, based on the um, you know level of detail that's provided, nor is contracted employee. Um, uh, wages or employment captured in any way by NTD. So, um, RT, so all this to say that RTD may be realizing efficiencies through the use of, of contract operations, but that um, we cannot determine from um, the, the NTD data. Um, so looking forward, you know, all, all this to say, there have been a great deal of changes since this analysis was done, right? Um, so one option would be to, you know, consider doing this comparison again when the 2020 NTD data is published. Um, but more importantly, and I believe RTD has this underway, conducting a more comp a more extensive compensation assessment. So really looking at the function and the and the structure uh, and roles and responsibilities. And, and as I said, I, I believe that's something that um, um, RTD has has been engaged in proactively. There's also the ability to conduct time studies and other uh, structural assessments. This can help uh, ascertain if there are any administrative ex um, excesses. And then finally, um, evaluate the effectiveness of contract uh, versus personnel expenses. So, you know, that would be a more detailed assessment um, and would likely require some partnership with other transit agencies to, to really get at, at that. So. Um, you know, again, the, you know, we so while we found on the whole that RTD does differ from its peers, you know, there's a lot of contributing factors to that. Um, you know, density, local culture, the bargaining agreements, um, and economies of scale, and, and specifically contract ops, which is outside of the scope of of what of of this particular work. So again, these are simply data points, and they do not necessarily indicate the efficiency at which RTD administrative staffing is operating. And that's, well, well, that's very important for us because when we report back to uh, back to the legislature and the governor and RTD on our evaluation of this, we need to qualify what we, you know, what the differences are and why it is a hard thing to evaluate and how reliable we believe that evaluation may be. Kathy, you probably yeah. will be able to contribute to that as well. It's a tough we, question. We'd be happy you know, to provide you with some. Are, you know, or, or apples and apples. Mm -hmm. We'd be able to help to provide some more of those um, sort of qualifiers also, if that would be helpful. You know, just yeah. sort of an example of working with another property when we were working um, with New York's MTA, um, there was an attempt as part of a big transformation initiative um, for an outside entity to say how many administrative staff they had um, and then look at consolidation across different of the agencies in MTA um, for streamlining. And, um, when they went into the, um, the staff data, the entity that was doing the analysis said, oh, well, look, we've got engineers and engineers so those are the same. And then we've got assistants. And so every assistant is the same. And, and working with MTA, we said, no, 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 hang on, time out. There are engineers, capital E, there are engineers, lowercase e. The capital E engineers are PEs, right? They're stamping plans, they're designing bridges. The lowercase e engineers 
are the guys that guys and gals that you call when a train breaks down to come and help fix it on the track right then right um and then there are sort of middle case engineers that are helping to figure out um, what a better design for a windshield wiper on a bus is so that the bus operator has better visibility over time and then they're replicating that on all of the other buses they are certainly not pe's but they also aren't just going out to the track to fix things um, well we understand there's a great deal of difference among all these different groups but what we want yeah. is just some feel for what the biggest differences are when we're looking at each category and mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to rush you but i know we've got a lot on our understood agenda. thank you yeah thank you Anne. thank you tanya did you get did you get through your slides did Great. two thumbs up thank you so much for having us today of course we appreciate your work on this glad to help tough thing for us to figure out all by ourselves all right um does anyone have questions additional questions rebecca did i, I thought you looked like you did yeah, and, and Rhett, you actually asked the, the question I, I had in my head at the time, but it sounds like the next step on this is, is Kathy's going to take a closer look and come up with some questions. Would we have the opportunity, Rhett, to, to add in additional ones on our end to that list? Because I'd like to have the chance to think about it more. Absolutely. And Ron, can you distribute the slideshow to, uh, and, and the preliminary report to all of the committee members so they can have a chance to have a look at this too. It's a lot to absorb. Yeah, yeah. certainly can, Rut. The 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 report was included in your agenda packet, so you you have that. You have access to that. Okay. And, uh, as uh, we'll we'll distribute the actual presentation from uh, North Highland uh, to you um, following the meeting as well. I would draw your particular attention to the four items that North Highland did identify sort of at the bottom of the executive summary and the end of their report if there are any of those further works that the subcommittee feels like they want north highlands help uh to dig further into uh in in this effort please please let us know and and we'll um we'll get that going great great and, and look forward to would you make sure that um i'm added to your next committee meeting because i don't usually sit on this committee so they may or may not be on my calendar so um if you would just make sure that I know when that is. I'm Perfect. sure Ron will do that. Ron? Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Kathy. I appreciate you being here. This is not our usual field of knowledge. Thanks for contributing. So um, we'll move on with the agenda, with the understanding that we're we're going to be, we have a little work to do, <laughs> as always. So. Our next agenda item is fiscal policy statement. Ron, this is uh, this is uh, yours. Yes, sir. Let's see. So again, this is this is one of those items um, highlighted for the accountability committee to review um, under the committee's charge. Uh, a review of RTD's fiscal policy. So uh, just by summary, um, RTD does adopt a fiscal policy each year um, uh, and then does modify as necessary. The policy contains uh, the board directed um, areas of revenue, investments, expenditures, capital improvements, fund balance, debt, budgeting, accounting, and grants, and then Note that the 2021 fiscal policy also includes uh, some policies related to COVID-19 response uh, to provide guidance uh, for both reductions and restorations of services. So did include a copy of the fiscal policy in the agenda packet for uh, the members. Uh, maybe I'll hit, a, maybe scroll down to, because um, I don't believe that there are generally significant changes to most of these. For the 2021, obviously, um, there are um, the specific issues related to COVID response and, and recovery from uh, COVID. So those were uh, specific um, and guidance for both how RTD should um, approach reductions as a result of the budget impacts of COVID-19. Um, 
kind of, again, first considering reductions to administrative costs first, all the way down to um, kind of not reducing service levels below what's currently being um, offered. Um, there's a policy statement relied, relating to the FISA balances, uh, which RTD has been contributing money to, um, and to, to kind of not utilize, not dip into the, that account balance um, except for board identified and approved projects such as the State Highway 119 bus rapid transit project. Um, the, um, and then likewise, guidance for restoration as uh, finances allow, um, again, starting with restoring um, uh, reserves to three months if possible, consistent with the fiscal policy related to reserves. Um, again, not utilize, not utilize existing FISA balances um, as, um, as you restore service, um, limit the use of uh, rubber tired service uh, to uh, contributions to FISA, that bus service, and then um, restoring deferred projects uh, that, you know, those sort of capital maintenance projects that were deferred as part of RTD's efforts to address the budget impacts and the financial impacts of the pandemic. And then finally, restoring service as ridership allows and, and returns. So just wanted to get that in front of the subcommittee. Um, happy to have a conversation or if any questions came up that we can uh, relate back to RTD and get, get feedback from them to the, to the subcommittee. Uh, I, I have one actually for Rebecca, the uh, State Highway 119 bus rapid transit. Uh, can you can you give us can you describe that a little more uh, to us? It's connecting Boulder and and uh, um, Longmont. Yeah, so this is a um, a key corridor for the region that has been um, on the list uh, for kind of the northwest area for a long time to look at expanding transit service. Uh, it was also brought up in the North Area Mobility Study that was done a few years ago. Yep. You know, I think the ultimate vision there is, is a, a BRT system that would run along um, 119. There's some interim steps before you get to BRT that you know we could look at additional um, queue jumps and other things just to make a, a bus operations run a little easier there. But that that is the vision that you'd see some sort of transit build out along 119. Does that answer your question, Rhett? Pretty much. Uh, in terms of construction, what's really required? Uh, you know, I understand we need buses, but is are there significant modifications to 119 that will be required? Is there a su substantial capital budget associated with that? I see uh, Elisa's uh, camera turn on, and she knows this corridor like the back of her hand. So <laughs> <laughs> let me. Oh uh, well. <laughs> So um, the 119 corridor um, can be done in phased projects. So there's some initial projects around queue jumps and intersection improvements and bikeway planning. But ultimately, the idea would be to put, put on 119 a bus rapid transit and bikeway um, system uh, modeled after the US 36 express lanes projects. And as Rebecca noted, 119 is the first of a handful of arterial bus rapid transit projects that were identified in the Northwest Area Mobility Study in recognition that the Northwest Corridor wasn't getting rail for decades and decades beyond when it was supposed to. And these were short-term mobility improvements that would provide some, some near-term um, transportation mobility to that corridor in the interim. And would this connect with the uh, uh, flyer the, that's currently, Flatiron flyer that's currently running into Denver? Is that the is that the idea of how it would work? I mean, if you if you're in Longmont and you want to get to Denver, then getting to Boulder doesn't get you to Longmont. I mean, to um, it's modeled after that type of fully multi multimodal corridor was the uh -huh. the reference. Um, the 119 corridor runs from Boulder to Longmont and is the second largest traffic corridor in Boulder County, second to the US 36 corridor, and brings in quite a bit of um, worker commutes from um, outside the county towards the north and east. So the idea is the, the um, you know, a bikeway bus rapid transit on a managed lane 
that's available for carpool and transit and um, single occupancy toll paying users as well. So that's the model. Did I answer your question? Pretty well. Yeah, the, the real question okay. is, do they tie together? Can you get off the, you know, this is the first mile, last mile issue all the time. Can you can you get off the uh, the planned 119 and connect with, for example, the Flatiron Flyer? If you want to go um, to they, the idea of the system would connect at the um, downtown Boulder Station. So yes, you could connect the two um, PRT corridors are connected in the city of Boulder. Okay. Good. Anyone else have any questions or comments on this part? I would just add Rhett, that um, yeah, there's probably a quicker way to do that, which is the uh, the L series buses that go down uh, from Longmont to Denver, um, rather than coming through uh, Boulder and getting to Denver. Right. Okay. So it, it's mostly associated with people that are, for example, living in Longmont and working in Boulder or vice versa. Is that what the key role of that is? I think you're muted. So, you're so muted. 119 specifically connects Boulder to Longmont, but so there's definitely the workforce in Boulder but a lot of 30% of the traffic on 119 comes from outside Longmont and the county from Larimer and Weld. So uh -huh. it's a busy corridor that feeds the work hub in Boulder. And okay. again, it's it, the idea is, is to provide mobility in, a, in, in an area that has yet to fully realize the promise of fast track. So it's a different form of mobility. It doesn't replace Northwest Rail, but it provides um, some immediate relief to a fairly congested um, area. So what's the time window for actually having something like that uh, in place? Uh, Rebecca, do you know, or does anyone else? How far out is this? It's not you know, it depends on the amount of money available, partly. Because uh, Elise mentioned there's phases available. Yeah. So. We're doing some some uh, additional analysis right now. CDOT is. Um, I think there's always an interest in looking for grants for this project. So it just depends. There are there. This is this is Ron from Dr. Cog. There, I there are some. 2025. It would. There are some initial phases already funded, uh, both through the Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program as well as some uh, RTD allocated funds and CDOT allocated funds. Um, so some of the some of the initial phases but not enough funding has been put together yet to complete the entire corridor all the way from Longmont uh, to Boulder as the environmental um, analysis has um, kind of laid it out, which is bus rapid transit operating within a shared um, managed express lane in the corridor uh, for most of its length. So not all of that is funded, but there are, there are some initial pieces that are, that are funded in the, in the near term over the next couple of years. Good. And are those uh, are those bus lanes dedicated bus lanes, or are they Lexus lanes where people buy into being able to drive on them as well? Or how's that planned? Well, not uh, I, from a I will not not accepting the premise of the term Lexus lanes, uh, which I don't think is an accurate description personally. Uh, Thank but you, <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is it is uh, conceived as. Uh, bus rapid transit operating within a shared managed lane that would be a tolled express lane in the corridor. And single occupancy vehicles then would be able to use that lane? For so a right toll. The... Okay. All right. But if it's the model of the US 36 express lanes is that it's it's managed to keep the bus flowing at a certain speed and you're allowed to add single occupancy told vehicles up to the point that it impacts that, but not more so. So it, it's a revenue stream, but it, it's not the purpose per se right. for the lane. The bus the bus is the top priority. And then there, then you have HOV3 carpoolers as well. And you can control that flow of those cars in or whether they're allowed in based on whether the buses are flowing at speed? So it's a congestion pricing. So you set the price 
to uh, okay. basically uh, affect the number of um, toll paying users. Right, got it. Okay, uh, are there any other questions or points of discussion that we should have on this part of the agenda? Anyone? Could, I'll, yeah. I'll ask um, probably the dumb question, but did was the, the point of bringing these up to get the committee's input on, on, on changes or suggestions on these sort of guiding principles? Or just was just just an awareness. I I think it's mostly an awareness, but part of that awareness is: are there things about it that we want to engage in or or try to contribute ideas to? So you know, we're in the business of making recommendations to RTD, and not every subject we discuss will necessarily drive. Uh, a new recommendation, but it could. I mean, I, th I think we need to understand what's happening up in the Northwest Corridor. Obviously, it has been a hot topic of conversation, both in the press and, and uh, in meetings over the last few months, and is not likely to go away anytime soon. So I think we, we really need to be aware of what the plans are and how all that fits together. And so I think it's a valuable topic for discussion. And Rebecca, certainly from a staff, our, our, our intent with getting sort of, you know, the the fiscal policy in front of the subcommittee, so you understand sort of what it is and how it's used by RTD, and as well as sort of, you know, the information we've been providing relative to RTD's budgets, the the trends, the administrative overhead, is to give the subcommittee information so that you can sort of identify where you want to direct our work, the consultants work, your own investigations to sort of um, identify um, opportunities for things that you wanna include in the final report, recommendations sort of addressing the charge of the accountability committee uh, that was provided to you. Thank you, that's helpful context. Thanks, Ron. Uh, let's move on to agenda item number five. And, uh, this is a look at the budgets from 2017 to 2021, and uh, it's analysis that Ron has done on summary and trends. And so I will turn it over to Ron. All right, I'm, I'm getting tired of talking today, Mr. Chair. But um, uh, again, I think this is, this, you know, again, this is one of those uh, sort of foundational and background pieces that we just wanted to make sure the, the finance subcommittee had available. For you to review, we did. I did um, with the help of Natalie uh, Shishido at CDOT pull together information from uh, about the last five RTD budgets or so in summary format, just to show some trends. And so I will I'll get down to the graphs first. Um, so the two that were included in the report, uh, the top one being operating and non-operating revenues and then um, expenses for the same for the same budget so starting with the 2017 amended budget going through the 2021 recommended budget or adopted budget uh, the most recent rtd budget and these these graphs are on the same scale so you can sort of you can compare them from top to bottom so they go from zero to uh, 2.5 billion dollars um, um, so you can kind of uh, see Sorry, yeah, and so you can see those uh, totals uh, across each of the budget cycles, and they are broken down by the base system, uh, which is sort of the rubber tire, the, the bus system, the fast tracks capital um, uh, project uh, piece of the budget, and then the fast tracks operations um, component of the budget. So these graphs show those three components that total up to the entire RTD budget. Um, so you can see the sort of uh, these trends across uh, the years where the base system uh, revenues, uh, which is um, kind of has has stayed relatively stable. There's you know some some ups and downs, but from 2017 to 2021 has stayed relatively stable. Um, the 21 recommended budget, by the way, did, does not include the the most recent COVID relief uh, funding. Uh, so that has not that had not been amended into the RTD budget. So that doesn't show here. 
Uh, so obviously with that additional $200 million or $200 million or so, uh, that will that will change. Uh, so this this shows the, the assumptions um, prior to that information being available. Um, the fast track project um, obviously has fluctuated um, over time and is now declining in terms of an expenditure. You know, the most recent project to be completed, the end line, um, not a lot of new sort of fast tracks uh, project um, projects coming online uh, in the near term. And then the um, fast tracks operations um, piece, you can you can see those have um, uh, kind of increased as new fast tracks lines have, have come on board. But what you see is sort of the overall, the operating and non-operating revenues um, staying largely, largely fat, flat over the, over the last um, several years with some fluctuations and differences depending on which piece of the budget you're looking at. But expenses um, kind of overall trending down, mostly driven by the reduced the reduced expenditures in the fast tracks project. So the operating side of the house, the base system, uh, the base the the base system piece and the fast tracks operations pieces um, have been um, increasing or staying sort of steady. So the decline in expenses really is mostly explained by declines in expenditures on the fast tracks project side. So um, just kind of wanted to get that in front of the committee. The more detailed numbers are included in the tables um, in, the, in the staff report, broken down again by operating revenue uh, and non-operating revenue on the first sheet, and then the operating expenses, debt service, capital expenditures, and fund balances on the second sheet. So you get a little bit more detail on those sheets. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to you, Mr. Chair, for any um, discussion with the subcommittee. Yeah, if you could go to the uh, operating revenue, non-operating revenue title page. Uh, it's really very striking to look at the differences in, you know, in the effect of COVID, you know, it, particularly even in the base system, which was not as, in terms of ridership, was not hit as hard, but it was still, you know, it, it goes to around half of what it was before uh, before the 2020, you know, in the 2017, 18, 19, uh, to down to 60, you know, budgeted for this year, 60 million compared to 125 million. That that really is a stunning drop, and uh, it, it it's really questionable how we're going to get there. It, it's also a little disturbing that. If you look at the fast tracks operating revenue, that the impact of all of the new lines that are brought on board have not really driven as much uh, fare box revenue as we would hope. We certainly, certainly that part's been hard hit by uh, by COVID. Rail ridership is is much has been decreased much more than than bus ridership, but pretty grim story any way you look at it so it seems to me that again getting back to the issue that the thing that i i don't see in a lot of these reports is ridership and to me ridership is in many ways the you know what what it's all about and so i uh i, I would really be interested in more interested in seeing a report like this if it included the stats on on ridership I, I did have a few other we talked before the meeting about some of the other changes uh you know the looking at operating expenses on uh on fast tracks and how those have gone up fairly dramatically when in fact the the actual operating revenue on the fast tracks has been not very not very impressive So I, I open it up to anyone else that has any comments or thoughts on this. No. I, I had a question for Ron, uh, Rob, if that's okay. Sure, Dan. Uh, on the on the graph, Ron, um, you know, there's a 
there's more ex on the expense side than there is on the revenue side. And I'm assuming that in the expenditures are uh, you know, that gap or the, the difference is being made up with bond proceeds or some other revenue source that isn't in the operating, non-operating revenues. Yeah, Dan, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my understanding is that's that's mostly driven again by the fast tracks capital, the the fast tracks project expenditures, which are which have largely been bond funded or, or otherwise funded. So yes, those those proceeds aren't necessarily captured in the operating and non-operating revenue side. Um, I think Doug McLeod was on the call earlier. He might have a, a better better, more complete explanation than mine. Hi, uh, yes, this is Doug McLeod. And yeah, you're absolutely right that that additional funding would come mainly from that we do include grant revenues in our revenues. Um, the bond proceeds and the certificate of participation proceeds, however, are not uh, considered revenues in our financial statements. So that's where that additional funding um, is coming from for the uh, the additional expenditures on the capital side. Okay, that helps. Thank you very much. I also noticed that the you know the new capital for fast tracks uh, is has gone down to zero in the 2021 budget but that's not a big surprise i suppose we're not building any more rail at the moment yeah from 234 million in 2017 to zero in the 2021 budget we built a lot of rail okay uh it, if, if no one else has any other uh, comments or questions, I'd like to spend some time looking at our uh, specific goals and objectives, focus areas. So uh, if, if we look at the first two items on our focus areas, uh, the, the first one really is something that we, and, and the second one I think are both things that we have already completed in terms of our recommendations and our reports uh, from the from the in, uh, preliminary uh, report that we created at the end of the year. Uh, so I, I don't plan to talk about number one or two in any of our future meetings. And uh, that's OK with everybody else. That's how we'll do it. But let's move on to some of the other focus areas. Uh, review recommended changes to RTD operations and policies to achieve a more sustainable financial model, including a review of investment policies, guiding principles, and debt strategies. Well, RTD is carrying a lot of debt, and I, I recognize that they're working to uh, essentially restructure some of that debt. Um, I, I uh, wonder if anybody could comment on how the uh, current uh, debt auctions are going on the new bonds. Doug? Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Doug. Yeah, uh, it's going very well. So um, tomorrow is the pricing date. Um, we've had several calls with underwriters in the last few days. Uh, everything's on track. Interest rates remain low. Uh, we have had a lot of interest from investors. Um, we had uh, part of the provision of the refinancing was to do a tender offer to save additional monies. Thereby, uh, we have a call date that's two years out. Um, some investors uh, chose to tender offer up their um, their bonds early, um, which will save both us and the investors. Um, it will give them a premium, save RTD additional funding. Um, we got a 20% participation in that tender offer. Um, we expect the sale to go well tomorrow. Um, we still expect the savings to be somewhere on the order of just north of $80 million on $800 million of par value bonds. And uh, we will price tomorrow and we will close on March 11th. So all looks good at this point in time. That sounds great. Um, I, I, I think it would be interesting for the committee to hear a brief report you know, maybe maybe five or ten minutes on 
on what happened with the bond sales and how that's impacted uh, impacted uh, RTD finances. I know that you do expect to have a significantly lower cost over over time. I don't know how much of that, you know, what is it per year, how far out, goes out quite a bit. You know, if you take 80 million in it, if that's the savings over <laughs> 20 or 30 years, it, it's good. And we certainly want to do that, but it's it's not going to change, uh, change operations or anything very much. Doug? Sure. Sure. Thank you. And and yeah, actually, we structured this refinancing and all the financing proceeds or gains from the interest savings are all uh, all belong to Fast Tracks because we're refunding uh, Fast Tracks bonds and the Fast Tracks TIFI alone. So um, Fast Tracks alone will be the beneficiary of all these interest savings of $80 million. Um, we've worked with our financial advisor and uh, Goldman Sachs is the lead underwriter on this deal um, to structure the refunded bonds to bring forward the majority of that savings into the, the period that what we call the midterm financial plan period, which is the next six years through uh, 2026. So we will start realizing some of those savings in 2021. And I believe it's somewhere around 60 million of the 80 million we will uh, realize in those first six years. Okay. And that was done intentionally just due to the uh, financial pressures on fast tracks right now. So we, we did structure that intentionally to get the savings pulled forward. Um, the, the remaining term of those bonds is 24 years. Okay. So and they're all green bonds. Yes. Grouped, classified green bonds, which certainly helps your ability to market those, I'm sure. Yeah, we had, um, we, so um, as part of the lead up to the pricing call, we do an invest, we post an investor presentation or Goldman Sachs does, um, that's available to the public and um, they track how many views they've gotten. I think we're somewhere around uh, 30 different institutional investors have looked. So we anticipate there being a great deal of interest. The um, last refinancing that we did with the private activity bonds in December, we actually have it in, had an oversubscription, meaning that we had more investors wanting to buy bonds than we had bonds available to sell. And that would be the ideal situation because we can then bring down some of the coupon rates that we are paying on those bonds and save even more money. So fingers right. crossed it will go well. Thank you. Elise? So Dave, uh, Doug, appreciate that update and that all sounds super positive. I guess I'm not a finance expert, but it seems like this is a place, and this is to the whole group, where we need to be creative and think outside the box because even this amount of refinancing, as positive as it is, isn't actually gonna move the needle sort of in a long-term major way on the huge debt load that RTD is carrying, which my understanding is is bigger than most transit transit agencies and, and significantly limits some of the options that it has for the future. And I, I feel like this is an area where we really need to um, um, spend some time and see if we can get some creative ideas on on what to do about it. Yeah, I, and I don't I because I'm not a financing expert. I don't bring a whole lot of those ideas to the table, but recognize I, I think we need to go out and find them. You know, I spent time this uh, this past two weeks looking at the B line and Northwest Rail and and the challenges of the proposals that are have been made in order trying to solve this. I, I think you're absolutely right, Elise. This has got to be we've got to rethink how we're going to solve this problem because as it currently stands, I don't see how we get there or get there anywhere close to when we need to get there. 20, uh, when I hear 2042, it, it just, you know, it's it so much happens in 22 years that I would think that there's some technologies that may be able to be applied to this that are totally different approaches. But, you know, I looked at the front passenger rail and I looked at the rush hour only service and I looked at the, the overall economics of line B and I tried to say, what, what would the subsidies be if, if we built this? And one of the big things I don't, I was unable to really tie down was uh, the ridership that we would anticipate on line B. And the, the estimates seem to be 
pretty much all over the map on what ridership would be. The, you know, the earlier uh, reports from 2014 were talking about if economic, and they made some projections on economic conditions that really didn't work out very well, but they were looking at up to 10,000 ridership. But all the RTD analysis has been in the neighborhood of, of four to four and a half thousand uh, estimated ridership. If you, if you take those things and you look at the cost of it, and you look at the operating cost of it, which can be, which, which can be derived from uh, some of the uh, reports that not, you know, the RTD draft initial unfinished quarters report versus the Northwest Mobility Study reports. The, the unfinished quarter reports, you know, that their estimate of operations alone over, if you say, this is going to be a useful life of 40 years or something like that, which is a pretty generous, long, useful life without having to rebuild the whole thing. I mean, if you look at the subsidies that come out of that, the rush hour only line service, and I'll be happy to share this with the rest of the committee and with anyone else interested, but I came up with like a $50 subsidy for the, for the rush hour only lines based on what was discussed in terms of the cost and everything from that. And, and even even the whole line B, it you know it comes out to like something like a a twenty eight dollar subsidy for those. This this is really a a conundrum of what we're going to do about about line B. And, and again, as you said, I think we've got to really think out of the box on it. Lynn, did you have a comment? You looked like you wanted to, or didn't want to. <laughs> I was just preparing in case we could. I, you know, I think um, uh, we had this study session the other night, the board did, and uh, uh, the governor came and spoke, and um, and Ms. Johnson is bringing back, um, she, she's working with staff to bring back a proposal, but what, um, you know, I think the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners, and, and uh, I know Eric Davidson is on here, one of the other directors, and I, and others are, are pushing for is to update the BNSF design study. And that suggestion came out of a meeting of, uh, of some of the NW, the Northwest MCC and, and, um, and RTD staff with BNSF last year, just about a year ago right now. And uh, um, I think a big focus of that needs to be um, you know, updating those ridership numbers and the cost numbers so that we really, um, are, are comfortable with the with the current numbers. I think the uh, ridership numbers come uh, from Dr. Cog information. I think, but I think making sure we have a real transparent process. We've obviously it's no surprise to anyone that we've lost the the faith of the voters in this area, and yeah. so getting those numbers and explaining why they've changed and and all of those things and making that very transparent to the the voters up here, I think, is an important next step, and that would be paid for. You know, the pro the proposal is that that would be paid for out of the the FISA fast track savings account. Well, I'll we'll continue to noodle that. It's it's a it's an interesting problem, but boy, it is a real problem right now. Oh, no. Well, anyway, if I could just add on to what Lynn's saying, I do think that that might be something that the committee would want to support RTD in in doing and spending some money to get updated cost numbers and ridership numbers, so we could really better wrap our hands around this issue. I think the other piece that um, if Front range passenger rail were to happen, um, it, it would make sense to um, merge the Northwest Rail with that proposal and make sure that it uses the Northwest Rail alignment. Um, the attractiveness of that is that it does increase ridership because you're adding a longer uh, corridor in which to draw riders from, and you would have the ability to track potentially large sums of federal money, Amtrak funding that could help at least change the 
the calculus on building it, operating money would still be, uh, you know, an open question. But yeah. I think those two things at least probably make sense for the committee to support as just sort of uh, doesn't solve the problem, but it it, it helps um, inform the problem. Uh, yeah, it helps us move forward, and I I think you know figuring out how to make the northwest corridor whole in some some manner given that the you know the the promise of fast tracks appears not to be likely to arrive anytime soon is also another area that we might might want to spend some time on what that looks like and i know other people on this committee have articulated concerns that it doesn't come at the expense of other um riders in the district but we do we do have to address the sort of breach of trust and how to rebuild that in a way that can help the entire system going forward. Yeah, and other corridors as well, I know are, are demanding attention. Um, the the thing about the passenger rail, the front range passenger rail that really struck me was that they're really they're talking about two to six round trips a day on that first phase you now there are two phases the first phase is about two billion dollars which is not insignificant uh, for the first stages of front range passenger rail and the and the guy that's the i don't know president or ceo or chairman or whatever i, I read that he said that uh the full version for rail service for the front range passenger rail is projected to be 20 to 30 years out uh, and cost of eight to fourteen billion dollars. Uh, those numbers really. The last time we were talking about numbers like that, we were talking about building maglev down I-70. You recall that whole process. Now I, I I was a little depressed when I got through with my analysis. Or not to be. So, um, Red, I don't want to bog down too much on this, but I, since it is such a hot topic right now and such a, a source of friction, I think it it really is a place where where our committee could particularly, uh, if we could come up with some new ideas, could particularly uh, provide value. To that uh, discussion. So, anybody that has the brilliant idea, I'm really ready to hear it. <laughs> Rebecca, you raised your hand. Does that mean? I think Dan was ahead of me. I'll defer to him. Uh, well, uh, I don't have any brilliant ideas, but um, I think there are, is the possibility that there could be more infrastructure funding that'll become available in the Biden administration. Uh, there is a bill that they're working on now, which is, I believe, a COVID relief bill for something in excess of a trillion um, that, uh, if it is passed and signed into law, would provide another 40 billion, or excuse me, 30 billion for transit uh, in 2021. And uh, the last bill, I think, had 14 billion in it for transit, and RTD uh, was able to get over 200 million from that one. Uh, I'm sorry, thing, how much was in the, are you saying is expected to be or might be in this uh, uh, $2 trillion? I, th bill? I think it's 30 billion is what I've heard. Uh, and how much was in, in the last one? 14, billion. 14, 14 billion. billion. Did you say 14? Yes, 14. I'm sorry if I'm not coming through very well. I'm probably speaking over you, I apologize. No. Um, and uh, the other thing that I heard, we have a, a lobbyist in D.C. And, uh, that uh, there's a possibility that earmarks might be coming uh, back into vogue. Um, you know, they, since about 2006, uh, there haven't been any earmarks. And so uh, currently they're thinking of uh, restoring earmarks. And uh, and it's, it's all about... Uh, <clears throat> You know the political clout that your delegation has and uh, the needs and uh, the case that you make but there just may be some more opportunities for rtd to get funding to help uh you know pay for some of these uh, light rail extensions or unfulfilled 
uh, pledges they made to the voters about some, some of the quarters that are not uh, completed yet. Um, the other thing is, is and this may not be the committee's purview, but I, I saw something in the uh, literature on the fast tracks in that presentation of many pages was about uh, the possibility of a one tenth of a percent sales tax or 0.15 percent sales tax, and how much revenue that could generate. And it doesn't seem like a lot. Um, I, I don't think that these quarters are going to get constructed without some additional revenue. You can cut back salaries, administrative staff, you can do a lot of things, but you're just not going to get there unless you have some additional revenue, some of which can be federal, but uh, probably going to need local uh, revenue to match grants and, and to cover local costs and so forth. So I think that's something that you know this committee may want to think about. Um, and, and the other thing is that um, you know, where I live in the Roaring Fork Valley, we have congestion. I mean, uh, I, I we all complain about it until I go over to the Front Range and you know come in from uh, Loveland or Longmont into uh, Denver during rush hour, and then I see what real congestion is like. Um, but we we think congestion is transit's friends. It, it, it friend it gives people a, a reason to use transit because their travel times are. Uh, are, are shorter or at least competitive with driving their own cars. Plus, uh, the city of Aspen uh, implemented paid parking back in 1996. And so the cost of driving uh, went up and, and the inconvenience of driving because of congestion at the entrance of Aspen. And we have exclusive bus lanes for the last three miles into town. So we have a, an alternative that we, we can uh, provide that's better uh, in many cases than driving your own vehicle and, and less expensive. But it seems like there needs to be, you know, if you want to do a light rail system, well, what is the reason? Are we wanting to do that so we can reduce congestion and we can make air quality better? Uh, that's going to be expensive, uh, you know. Uh, no. fighting and and I've, I've looked at the Texas uh, Transportation Institute's estimate of the cost of congestion in, in the Denver Aurora area, and it, it's around $2 billion and yeah. lost time and you know a lot of other uh, a lot of other related uh, factors on it and and that seems to not be part of the discussion about transit uh, we're not effectively making the argument that you know it would, may cost us much but the impact of it is is uh, is potentially huge the other thing yeah. is in the 2018 tax bill uh, I was I was happy to see that they eliminated the ability of corporations to take to essentially write off as a tax uh, the cost of paid parking that they gave their employees. Uh -huh. I'm sure a lot of employees were pretty annoyed by that change, but paid parking, you know, there's no such thing as free parking. Someone's paying for it. And in that case, the taxpayers were essentially paying for that parking, which I that was one of the few things about that tax bill that I did like. Well, I guess to, to end my my point is to say that, you know, it has to be part of a strategy that has uh, carrots and sticks. Uh, that uh, if if you want to reduce congestion and if you want to make air quality better, you got to give people incentives for doing what you think is the more environmental friendly mode of transportation for them to use, or you need to make the other alternatives a bit more expensive. Now, the highways are going to get congested over the next 30 years, and if that doesn't do it, uh, nothing will. But then CDOT may come in and want to add some lanes and so forth, and then they'll build it and they will come. And, yeah, those added and, lanes really worked well for LA. <laughs> so, so the, you know, if if you can compare the cost of adding those lanes to what the cost of building the right. rail system is, then then you know people have a good viable alternative that they'd say well let's do that and then the beauty of the light rail as i understand it is that you can just add cars to the same train and you can transport more people and it becomes more efficient at at some point uh, yeah, so if you look at the this committee wants to 1.1 billion plus we we're spending on i-70 right now to widen that that's real money oh and it's it's incredible i make that trip uh from Newcastle to Pueblo 
probably every couple of weeks. And what they're doing is amazing. But when it gets completed, it'll be great for a while. But how long? Um, anyhow, and the other thing is when you see. have to do something like that, it shuts down that corridor practically yeah. with all the construction that's going on. So the congestion for a period of time gets a lot worse until it's all finished. So and uh, what I was uh, trying to say is that it seems like there needs to be more comprehensive look at this and not just building the light rail without some of the other measures that might, might be necessary to get people to use it to make it more cost effective. You know, Dick Lamb told me once that you, you never, you'll, you'll never, uh, succeed by, or he said, you can never underestimate the, the depth of knowledge of the average voter. Because when you get to, as soon as you take an issue that's complicated and, and you put it in the, in the, the uh, uh, process that it's got to go through as a vote of the people, uh, for example, to get matching funds, to which is a lot of what this federal money may wind up being in this not for the COVID part, but for the next round of it, uh, boy, we're going to have a hard time going to the voters and getting money for, given the the heat and the lack of light that's going on in that debate right now in the public, it's going to be a tough sell. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, this is this is Ron. I just wanted to do a quick time check. It's about 18 minutes after the hour. Um, appreciate appreciate all this conversation. Um, at, help kind of frame perhaps the conversation i know in the work plan we've got sort of the continued conversations around the unfinished fast tracks corridor it's kind of scoped out over the march april and may uh, broken out into some pieces so um if the subcommittee if if that's the subcommittee's direction to us to try to bring pieces of information forward for you to kind of shape your conversation around those issues is is that your direction to us we we do want that. Um, we we need to have open discussions about what's left and how we're going to get it, you know, get the charges to our committee completed. And so I I think we'll probably have some specific requests along the way. I know Rebecca, you've been working on the um, the issue of the. Uh, the pardon me, just a minute. That's not it. Transparency. The dashboard. Yeah. Do you have any um, any observations about that and what you might need in order to be able to move forward? Um, I'm actually a little behind on that. Uh, Lynn kindly reached out, um, and I've just had a, a pretty insane couple weeks, but I still would like to loop back with uh, with Doug because that's where we'd sort of left it because RTD RTD I think was on the the cusp of bringing on um, some of their own um, account transparency tools. So I wanted to loop back with them and I just haven't had the chance yet, but I'll, I'll move that to the top of my list. Okay. And Lynn, thanks again for uh, being the connector there. I appreciate it. As always, thank you, Lynn. You know, it's it's uh, remarkable when you have a full-time job, how doing another full-time job can get in the way of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we appreciate all the volunteers we have in this committee. Um, so if you, if you look through the, the rest of our uh, areas, the, the regional sub-regional funding, a lot of that, it seems to me, is the work the governance committee is doing. And I think it's more valuable for us to try to coordinate with them than to try to reinvent that wheel. Elise, you sat in on most of those meetings. Is that a fair assessment? Is there anything specific yeah, so. that you would contribute to that other than support? Elise, I'm sorry. You the, your question cut out a little bit for me. Okay. Uh, so my my comments on the regional sub regional funding allocation questions. It's really I think a lot of that the governance committee has been more involved in, in terms of how. Uh, yes, and they're gonna uh, they're putting together sort of a draft high level proposal on that that I think we can react to. So I don't think we need to do anything yet from the finance committee standpoint. Okay. And I sit in on their meetings as well. So it's uh it's good that we're both following that. 
Um, we're working the administrative overhead. We talked about that today. Uh, Highland Consultants and, and with Kathy's help and, and some other input, hopefully we'll be able to nail that uh, nail that one down earlier on. Um, the equitable resolution of unfinished fast tracks corridors is a big issue, and um, I want to I want to put together some ideas that are kind of out of the box ideas on that and uh, get back and get some feedback from the rest of the, of the committee. And so um, I'll try to I'll try to get something concrete done in that in the next uh, two to four weeks and see where we can get. So beyond that, um, partnership opportunities, it, it really seems like, you know, in, in some of our last, uh, last recommendations, we did cover some of that. I don't know what else we need to do there beyond uh, what was in those last recommendations. Anybody have a feel, strong feeling about that? Or should we focus on the unfinished corridors and some of those other things? I, I do want to say on the partnership opportunities, I've been thinking a lot about the issue of last first last mile and how we have managed that and, and the bypass communities, the communities that are kind of transit deserts. And to me, if you if you look at it as a business, RTD, that's a big market. That's those people who are really underserved communities. Those are people that we could both add value to, you know, try to find ways for them to be able to get to, to new job opportunities and to get new educational training opportunities. That connection seems like it has a lot of social uh, value to it as well. And and um, so I've I've started not just thinking, but trying to put some thoughts together on that. And I may may have something by the next committee meeting for that as well. To, Mr. I, and if I do, I I know it's I don't it's hard to walk into a committee meeting and suddenly be hit by this big stuff. So maybe I'll share it among whoever may be interested in seeing those ideas. Certainly the committee members, uh, uh, including uh, our representatives from RTD and Ron and Dr. Cog and all those folks, but whoever wants to wants to provide feedback on it so that we can have a more informed discussion at the next committee meeting. Mr. Chair, this is Ron. There is a, because the partnership issue does sort of cross, cut across all three of the subcommittees and various aspects of it are being talked about by all three subcommittees, there is, there's an effort underway to pull together a joint partnership discussion the afternoon of March 1st to coincide with sort of hosted by the governance subcommittee. Um, mm -hmm. So keep your eye out for more details on that. We, uh, uh, Frank Bruno, who's um, in charge of Via Mobility, who and Via Mobility provides a lot of those kind of partnered services um, in a variety of communities around the region, but also with RTD um, under contract to RTD. So uh, Frank will be participating in that. We're working on putting together a panel and sort of the framework for that conversation. So just wanted to. Give everyone a heads up um, on that. Look for more details um, in the, you know, in the next week or so. Terrific. Yeah, I did see that an announcement. They were canceling the Friday meeting and um, going to reschedule something for that. So I look forward to hearing more about it. Elise, did you? Is that I was just going to add on the last point about partnerships. I think there's there's two benefits. One is that there may be lower cost alternatives to solving some of these problems. I think General Manager Johnson has mentioned several times, you know, you don't need a, you know, a huge boss to solve the first and final mile issue necessarily. It could be a much more targeted, um, cost-effective technology. And um, I think the the other opportunity is you may be able to leverage additional funds into the system through partnerships at the local level, either through the private sector or local government. And so the cost saving piece of that is something where I think is is squarely in the finance committee's domain. Right. Um, so I think some I, I look forward to hearing your ideas. I, I know I've provided sort of examples of 
partnerships that are in the process of of coming together or have been successful and there may be uh, you know i'm sure there's plenty of others to look at that we could be encouraging rtd to explore i think you know the new leadership is, is headed that way anyway mm -hmm. um, and i think some of our legislative changes that we proposed will facilitate those partnerships as well but there may be more that we can do and there may be more opportunities for um, uh, pointing either state transportation or federal transportation funding to some of these partnerships as well. Right. And, and um, some, of, some of my thinking on this are public-private partnerships, both in terms of employers that need to move people to, to get people to, to, their, to the jobs that they're creating, but also with, with uh, like City of Denver's very sensitive about bypass communities that aren't getting transit services and so they may might be a good partner for rtd to to do some uh at least pilots but maybe long-term uh partnerships to try to address some of those things first mile last mile issues on some of that so well and this yeah. may dovetail with a local service council proposal as well where you get some more local input on what some of those partnerships might be to solve all on the ground issues because first and final mile issues are largely you know what to, what needs to happen in that locality so okay uh, recognize there's an overlap with the governance committee's proposal on that front well when i get a real rough draft i'll send it to you first <laughs> We seem to be able to work pretty well on some of these things. Work together pretty well, but just as a you know first look at ideas. Okay, uh, if we have any other comments, I invite you to speak up. Otherwise, I think we're getting close to being done. Mr. Chair, this is Ron again. I just wanted to refer the committee to the link that was provided in the agenda on a, a very comprehensive presentation that Bill Van Meter with RTD provided to the RTD board in study session last Tuesday related to Northwest Rail, a um, piece of fast track. So good, good, really good background information as right. the finance subcommittee sort of digs into unfinished fast tracks issues over the next couple of months. Uh, mm -hmm. That provides some really good background. Would encourage all the subcommittee members to make sure you review that. It, is that the uh, uh, what's it called the unfinished corridors uh, report? This it, is this is more narrow than that. Uh, this is this is more specific to the Northwest Rail piece of the unfinished fast tracks corridor. So the unfinished okay. fast tracks report has been provided to the subcommittee before. Uh, so y'all should have access to that. This is. This is a deeper dive into Northwest Rail in particular. It's not the thing that's called RTD Draft Initial Unfinished Corridors Report. This is a deeper than that dive? That's correct. Because that one had some pretty good information in it as well. Okay, I, I, I look forward to that, to checking out that link. And that link is in the agenda? Yes, sir. I missed it. It's on your other matters. Thank you, Ron. Any other uh, comments before we adjourn? Well, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your input and engagement and hard work. Thanks, Rhett. Thanks, bye.